We are ready to go. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Accessibility Advisory Committee meeting. Members of the public may watch the meeting live on oakville.ca or the town's YouTube channel. Agenda and materials are available on oakville.ca under town hall agendas and meetings. We have five discussion items and three information items on the agenda today. Are there any regrets? There, there is a regret. Uh, Ms. Julia Romano is not here. Okay. Uh, are there any declarations of pecuniary interest? Hearing none. Seems none. Yep. Hearing none, we're moving on to the confirmation of the minutes of our previous meeting, the minutes from March 21st, 2024. Are there any errors or omissions to report? I'd entertain a motion to approve the minutes of March 21st, 2024. Who's willing to speak? So moved. Thank you, Deborah. Any seconder? I second. Second. All in favor? There is no second. All in favor, please raise your hand. Motion carries. Re the recommendation of the minutes of the Accessibility Advisory Committee meeting of March 21, 2024 be approved. Now we go into the dis discussion items. The first discussion item is inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility, the multi-year plan 2024 to 2028. We have a report from staff. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> good afternoon. Um, my name is Rebecca Brooks. I work in the town strategy policy and communications department. And while I was the lead staff uh, person to develop the inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility multi-year plan, there were many, many staff across the organization who supported its development. I'm here today to share with you the town's first townwide inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility multi-year plan idea for short. Uh, I did want to mention that I was also the town's liaise with this accessibility advisory committee before Andrea for many years. So this committee is near and dear to my heart. Next slide, please. So the work of IDEA is not new to the town. We have been reporting on improvements for 20 years. However, this plan represents our first systems-wide plan that looks at both our workplace and community. To develop the plan, we partnered with the Canadian Centre for Diversity and Inclusion Consulting, Inc., uh, CCDI in brackets for short, they're an external organization leading in this work, and they have worked with many industries from public sector, uh, education sector, and private sector. Some of the organizations they've worked with include the Ability Center, ASL Canada, Alzheimer's Canada, or Alzheimer's Society, Canadian Cancer Society, Diabetes Cancer uh, Canada, and the MS Society of Canada. There's been significant work we've done in this area and uh, we undertook significant consultation throughout the process. Um, but at the core, this work is about community belonging, which is one of council's key strategic priorities and supports its vision to be a vibrant and livable community for all. Next slide, please. Inclusion, diversity and equi equity and accessibility we know not only benefits our employees and our residents and the broader community, but the overall success and sustainability of our organization and the community at large. So the commitment statement that was developed through consultation uh, for Oakville is to be an inclusive workplace and community where everyone feels they belong. And this commitment statement was specific to the IDEA multi-year plan, but it does span across all of our town's um, 
all of our town's plans and including the accessibility multi-year plan, which I know you've been working with Andrea and Sarah on to develop a new one. Uh, just to kind of clarify the difference between the two plans is that the inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility multi-year plan really addresses actions more broadly to support all of those areas, while the multi-year accessibility plan really focuses on the um, regulations or requirements in the integrated accessibility standards regulation. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide um, talks about where we started. Uh, we started uh, with foundational work in about 2021 to 2022 when we worked with the Canadian Centre for Diversity and Inclusion to conduct a current state inclusivity assessment. And this assessment was um, quite, uh, quite thorough in that we, there was multiple deliverables and actions that we undertook. The first was a policy review, which included about tw uh, 50 of our town policies and procedures uh, being reviewed by CCDI, which included such policies as um, recruitment, respectful workplace, but also the town's multi-year accessibility plan. The second deliverable was to research best practices. So we looked at other municipalities and other organizations to develop our plan. The third was to conduct benchmarking um, in which we did an employer benchmarking survey that evaluated the town's level of progress as it related to um, the idea plan policies and practices against uh, the global diversity, equity and inclusion benchmarks, uh, which are standards for organizations around the world. Uh, the fourth one I'll draw your attention to is community consultation. And we did this and we conducted consultation in two phases. The first phase was really focused on our community groups, uh, including our AAC. So we hosted 21 virtual sessions because as you know, at that time we were in COVID, so we couldn't really do the in-person work that uh, we would normally do. Um, <clears throat> but we had 21 virtual focus groups and interview sessions with representatives from over 60 community groups uh, that were focused on faith, culture, social services, youth, health care, and other areas. The second phase included broad community engagement with the entire Oakfield community, which included our residents, businesses, residents associations, et cetera. Uh, this was through a survey but we also had some boots on the ground work where staff did go to the GO station, food banks, and uh, town community centers. And we had about 600 surveys completed at that time. In terms of the fifth uh, deliverable there on the screen, it would be our staff engagement. Uh, we conducted our first employee survey dedicated to IDEA. And the survey had two components, a demographic uh, census and inclusion and belonging survey. The survey was available to all of our town staff and our Oakville Public Library staff, <coughs> full-time, part-time, and contract. The sixth uh, action deliverable on the list was to look at um, establishing diversity and inclusion measures. So as I mentioned, we looked at the uh, global diversity, equity, and inclusion benchmarks for those measures. Um, the global benchmarks is really a framework to benchmark our progress. It provides practices, policies, and actions, um, and best practices from across the world. So it takes a holistic approach in looking at measurement. In addition to those global benchmarks, the town's also measuring the percentage of residents who identify a sense of belonging in the community, as well as employee turnover rate, and the town's workforce compared to uh, Oakville's work force for underrepresented groups. Of course, the last deliverable on that current state assessment was to develop the draft multi-year plan. Um, next slide, please. So it was through the consultations along with the work noted on the last slide that our draft plan was formed. Staff then presented a draft plan to council at the end of last year. So it was in, we presented in December and we opened it up for more feedback. While we had done a lot of work um, and a lot of prior consultation, we felt it was important to provide the draft plan to the community for one last round of feedback before confirming a final plan. Next slide, please. 
On this slide, um, I just wanted to review the feedback with you related to accessibility. So the feedback period was uh, for six weeks from that council meeting on December 18th to January 31st of this year. The feedback was submitted by email, phone, and a dedicated online feedback form that we had established, as well as comments came in through social media. We received just under 300 comments in total. Um, <coughs> And I've pulled out the ones related f to accessibility for you here. Overall, uh, we heard that the plan uh, was well received, but that there was comments that uh, felt that the plan was too general when thinking about accessibility and people with disabilities. There was also interest in knowing the progress the town was making towards compliance of the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act. Um, I can completely understand why those comments would come forward and we did uh, provide our response through that council report that clarified that the town's dedicated multi-year accessibility uh, plan um, would house the actions specific to accessibility and that we absolutely report on the progress towards AODA compliance and it's posted on our website. Specific to the plan, there were comments on the lack of color contrast between the background and font colors, and that the term disability should be, brought, should be used broadly to cover the array of disabilities experienced by people. Again, we completely appreciate those, all comments to improve the readability and important elements of the town, and we updated the plan accordingly. You uh, have the plan as Appendix A in your package if you've had a chance to look at it. Last, uh, there were some specific questions about accessibility requirements that were referred to Andrea and Sarah with the town for the multi-year accessibility plan update. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so with all the feedback in hand, we made changes and took forward a final plan to council on April 29th of this year. The final plan includes 40 actions under four strategic goals to move us forward in our idea journey. The first one is foundational to drive the strategy. The second goal is internal relating to our workforce. The third goal is community, and this is focused completely on our external community. And the last one is around sustainability and communications, making sure that the plan is <coughs> sustainable for future. The plan uh, was approved by council and each action associated, uh, has an associated time frame for completion between 2024 and 2028. Next slide, please. This is my last slide to let you know that our staff have begun to roll out the plan and scope actions both internally and externally. We will continue the momentum and our commitment to IDEA and community belonging. We have also committed through the plan to report annually on the progress of this plan in addition to the accessibility multi-year plan, which will include emerging best practices and academic research perspectives and studies related to IDEA to ensure that the plan and actions are rooted in research and best understanding of modern idea principles in recognition that this is a dynamic space. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you for having me. I hope you feel the town's commitment to inclusion and belonging through the information that I've provided you. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you for your great report. And is there, are there any questions from the committee? Yes. Deborah. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, just a, if I may, I just want to ask a couple of questions around, um, so just mainly around some of the goals. Is that okay? Yes, please. So around the uh, goal one, there is a, under 1.2 leadership and accountability, there's provide training on uh, safe spaces, training to all leaders. It says 25 to 26. I just want to have clarification. Is that commencement or completion? because there's a, a couple, um, and again, under uh, goal two, uh, 2.1, there's also rec um, a recommendation around training too. So I just wondered, again, 25, 26, is that uh, commencement or completion? In some cases, it's both. 
Um, if over a two year time span, usually that will be the commencement of the work for towards completion of the work at the end of that term. However, I would say a lot of the work's already starting this year for 2025, and then in 2025 we'll start for 2026, and in fact, actually, some of the actions for 2026 have already started. So <clears throat> I can't say that it's a complete or start for all of them. It's, it's implementation through those years. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Just one. Sorry, just one more, Rebecca. Um, so rather than, I don't want to take up too much time, are you still, like I did see the plan, I did provide, are you still open for uh, feedback on some of the areas or is it closed? Well, the feedback period has closed. However, we're always looking for feedback to improve the plan. So if you have any additional comments, please feel free to email me or have a, we can have an offside conversation because okay. um, I'm happy to get that from you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Question again, any further comments or questions? Hearing none, I would ask for a motion uh, to the committee to receive the report. I'll move to receive the report. Thank you, Dylan. Thank you. A seconder? There's no second. Sorry? There is no secondary. Okay. All in favor, please raise your hand. Motion carries. Thank you very much for that report. We do, we really appreciate it. Now, we're going to come next to item 4.2, the accessibility map refreshment. And Andrea is going to make this presentation. I will. Thank you very much. Okay, so we'll go to the next slide, please. So hello everybody, thank you again for joining us today. Um, we're quite happy to be here to speak with you about the Accessibility Map Refresh Project. If you haven't had the opportunity to use the online map, uh, we will be providing a demonstration shortly. Um, so before I introduce the staff and just a little, a little history before we begin. So Frank Goner, uh, Supervisor of Business Solutions and Analytics with Strategic Business Services, he's here with us uh, virtually today and uh, Rebecca Brooks, Corporate Strategy Program Advisor, who, who just presented, uh, she consulted with the AAC in March of 2017 about the creation of an online map. The, the intention was to display accessible features within the town. So while this information, like parks, parking spaces, was readily available, at the time there was no one single map that the public could easily access to find this information. So the committee was asked to provide feedback on two different styles of maps, the type of information included, and the way the maps would be displayed, include, including colors and layers. So after this important consultation, the accessibility map was established and released to the public in 2018. So fast forward now to 2024, while the, the data is current and automatic updates do happen, the look and feel is a little out of date and additional features we feel would be really beneficial to be included in the map. And staff are looking to begin the work on this map refresh and that is why we are here today because we want your input. Um, and so Frank is with us virtually today, as I mentioned, um, and also Jeff Smalley, Creative Services Advisor. He's the, uh, the, the creative brain of the town, as I like to say. The, uh, the three of us, including some other staff, we will be involved in the, the map uh, refresh update. Next slide, please. So this is what the map looks like, but what I will ask uh, IT to do just now is to go to the live site so I can show you some features of the map to see the various layers and how it's laid out. Um, and please uh, please ask questions along the way. So feel free if you do have a question as we're, as we're going through the demo, um, just, just please jump in, raise your hand, whichever you'd like. And I think I have access, yes I do, okay. Uh, so you can see here the layers. We have parking, parks and playgrounds, recreational trails and transit. So the user of the map has the ability to go through and uh, click and let me just see, you can expand down in uh, 
to narrow in. So if you are planning to visit a certain part of Oakville and you wanted to find out uh, what municipal parking lots are downtown or what on-street parking is available, you can do that. We also have here parks and playgrounds. Um, and I'm just gonna zoom out a little bit. Might need a refresh, but we'll see. Okay, we'll go to recreational trails. So you can see here, um, we've identified where all of the recreational trails are and as well if there's stairs. So you can see these small little red dots here indicate that there are stairs. And then lastly is transit. So we've identified the bus stops here, accessible stop bus stops and, and non-accessible bus stops. And if there are any questions specific to transit, I know, I know they have a couple items on today's agenda, so we can, uh, we feel free to, uh, to ask questions about that. So what we're really asking, um, I'm just going to throw out some ideas of what we are looking, uh, what information we're looking from you, what feedback, what type of feedback we're looking for. So are there any colors that aren't working or not contrasted enough? Are the icons okay? The accessible icon, do we want to add another to indicate stairs um, or not in, in other areas outside of the recreational trails label? Um, is the text size large enough? Um, other, other ideas to think about is would it help to have the option to turn on the photo layer? So data related to parks and recreational trails, perhaps not captured on the map, uh, such as name, location, and size. And this, this information is currently available on the Open Data Catalog, which is online, but of course, we really do wanna make this accessibility map as comprehensive as, as we can and as user-friendly as we can. So would it also help to have the address of parking spaces, parks to have a clickable link for directions? Would it be beneficial to label heavy traffic areas for those that may have high anxiety and or are looking for an accessible parking spot? So those are just some ideas that we wanted to share with you. So uh, Frank, who's with us with uh, Strategic Business Services, he looks after the, 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 the GIS, the map portion of it, and Jeff obviously would look after the, the creative aspect of it. So I will at this time invite Jeff or Frank to add any other thoughts for the committee to consider. Um, and if not, then I do open up the floor to any questions and feedback. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah, one thing I want to mention is when we built it last time, we we did work with your team to get feedback on color contrast, but you know things have changed, and we're more than open to changing some of this these types of information. Um, and as Andrew said, like if there's certain data sets that you think is beneficial, um, let us know, and we can always see if we can actually add them in. So as much feedback as possible is would be great. Um, if you have ideas or other groups that we might want to engage with, please let Andrew know. Because uh, we're always open to be to be doing more updates on it, but especially for the user. My question is this: It's beyond the scope, I think, of the town of Oakville. <laughs> However, there is a person has developed a, a website in Toronto looking at accessible places in terms of uh, restaurants uh, and other businesses. And for instance, in downtown Oakville, I think mainly due to the heritage condi conditions, the entrance way into a lot of the buildings and stores, there's a lip about yay high. And I know why it's there is because of the building codes from many, many years ago, but it makes those, those buildings totally inaccessible for somebody in wheelchair. Is there anything we can do about that and show something like that on the map? I would say there's the potential for it. Uh, I would want to, we would need to see what type, what type of information it is. Um, but we also have to make sure that the information is, can be maintained. Um, so this is like, it's a great idea. So it's something I can, we can talk it over with Andrea and their team when we start redeveloping it. Thank you. But if you have sources for this type of information, please pass it, uh, share it with us. And and if I can add to that as well, so part of the um, 
work that we've done in developing the multi-year accessibility plan, there was a lot of feedback around private businesses. So of course, uh, we are limited with what we what we can do with private businesses because uh, we do only have to we, we can only look at town facilities. However, in that we have started the conversation with economic development to see how we can better provide private businesses resources around accessibility. Uh, so so conversations have started in that area for sure. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any other questions or comments? Uh, Mr. Chair, I see Devin's hand up online. Devin, Devin Bright has his hand up. I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. Hi. Thanks. Uh, and thanks for this initiative. I just wanted to reference uh, mainly the base layer that is used in that ArcGIS tool. I think it's a great tool. It's a professional tool. But one thing that makes uh, the user experience just a little bit more challenging in those types of tools um, is that we're all used to using the street view data as a base layer. And so if it were possible to consider using this tool with a different base layer that I think is more familiar to folks, people who aren't maybe map oriented or people trying to interpret visually, I would, I would just recommend to think about that as a base layer. I, and then just while I'm talking, I just wanted to share also, I, I, think, um, the, I think the website you're referring to is the Access Now app. Um, and so I would just recommend that the folks working on this look at Access Now uh, because they're a pretty good example, I, I think, of something like this, though I see a great benefit to Oakville doing this independently and adding granularity. Um, uh, and, and, and so my last, so I'll just an omnibus of comments here. My last comment is um, to also think about what granularity makes sense um, because I saw some notes there, but an accessible stop will at what point does it stop being not accessible or start being accessible? And I think there might be room for nuance there around a particular restaurant's menu text size or something. So that's that's tricky and that could be a lot. So just a comment there. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Any further comments or questions? And Mr. Chair, if I may, I, I do encourage the committee members um, to continue to provide feedback. If, if something comes up in the next few weeks, we're going to... Uh, we are going to continue this work and we will be bringing back, we, we hope to bring back a final product in December for the committee to take a look at. Um, and so, so please share any feedback you have along the way. Thank you. Finally, any further questions or comments? If there are no more, I would entertain a motion to uh, accept this report. I'll move to accept. Thank you. All in favor, raise your hand. Moving on, item 4.3, the Oakville Transit Annual Accessibility Plan for 2024. Good afternoon. Hello, good afternoon. <laughs> Uh, nice to see some familiar faces. Mm -hmm. um, I am Joanne Phoenix. I'm the Manager of Planning and Administrative Services with Oakville Transit um, and uh, previously sat as a staff member on this committee for a number of years, which is why I say nice to see familiar faces again. Um, I'm here today to provide um, an overview of the Oakville Transit Annual Accessibility Plan. Uh, a copy of the plan was provided in your agenda. It is purposely in a final draft format, and that is so that if you do have any comments um, you wish to make this evening or in the next few days, uh, I am uh, going to be incorporating those into the plan before we finalize it and put it into its, uh, its final design um, uh, status if I if I could and before it becomes posted on the website next slide please so Oakville Transit does create an annual accessibility plan uh, and uh, that's a requirement under the AODA uh, we were here last in September of 2023 and today I'm providing you as I mentioned with an overview of the 2024 accessibility plan next slide 
So I, I would just like to highlight a few of the barriers that have been addressed previously. There are a number of barriers identified in the plan itself. I'm not going to run through them all, but just wanted to highlight a few things here for you today. One of the things we have more recently um, done is, is introduced free fairs for youth and seniors in May of 2023. Uh, so youth, seniors, and children uh, in the town of Oakville ride free on Oakville Transit on all services. We also conducted and continue to conduct an audit of the audio and visual display of the onboard next stop announcements on our vehicles. And as I indicated, we uh, continue to do that work and will be continuing to do that work on an ongoing basis. We have also just recently introduced new software to support our ride on demand system. And that has included improved booking capabilities through an app, through the web, and also through the telephone. We also introduced uh, new digital maps on our website for all of our routes this year. Uh, the previous maps were interactive uh, maps that were, uh, I'm going to use the words, not terribly user friendly. Um, and these are static maps uh, that are much, um, much easier, I believe, for our residents to understand. Next map, please. Um, and again, just noting a few additional barriers, we, we continue to have a joint specialized transit application review process that is joint between Oakville, Burlington, and Milton. And that does include in-person assessments uh, when required, if required. We also maintain a designated transfer location at the Oakville Hospital for Oakville Caravan and Burlington Handy Van for the, tra for the specialized transit system. Next slide, please. Um, I have been, uh, highlighted before some of the accessibility features that are on our conventional buses. Uh, again, we maintain high color contrast in the vehicle, uh, that, that's with um, stanchions and, and uh, edges of the flooring. And in some cases, if there is a step at the back of the vehicle on stair nosings. Uh, all of our buses, 100%, are low floor buses with accessible ramps. As I just mentioned, there is audio and visual uh, next stop announcement technology in our buses, as well as stop request indicators throughout the bus. Next slide, please. Uh, in addition, we have on-street um, stop infrastructure. Uh, we have previously increased the level of uh, service for clearing snow at the bus stops. Uh, in addition to a bus stop relocation program for standardization of the location of the pole and sign at our stops. Uh, that is also a, uh, a continuous project as well. And if we could, uh, next slide. So some of the um, actions planned for 2024 include ongoing bus stop infrastructure improvements. This is the addition of concrete landing pads, walkways, and shelters at our bus stops. In some cases, it is the uh, net new addition of concrete. And in some cases, it is adding a, uh, additional concrete um, to make the landing um, surfaces larger. Um, in most cases, that would mean trying to accommodate both front door and back door with concrete. While the rear door of the bus is not ramp equipped, um, it still provides for greater accessibility for everybody when they're stepping off the vehicle onto a flat concrete surface. We have also uh, in the process right now, sorry, we are also in the process of introducing route numbers on our bus stop signs to improve wayfinding so that somebody who does uh, approach the bus stop can see which route serves that bu particular bus stop. Of course, in some cases, it is only one route. In other cases, it is multiple routes. Um, and the design that we have right now needs uh, um, accounts for the fact that some of our routes have up to five different 
Some of our stops have up to five different routes, um, and so uh, the, the decals um, have to fit into the space of the bus stop sign. We will look at, in future, when it is time to replace the signage, we will look at having those route numbers incorporated into the design of the sign. And uh, we are continuing to expand our ride-on-demand service to additional neighborhoods. Um, we had already provided ride-on-demand service in southeast Oakville, as well as north Oakville. And we are expanding that service to the Falgerwood area, as well as to the area I'll refer to as Palermo Bronte West. And that is coming at the beginning of July. Next slide, please. This is just a, a graphic um, representing some of our uh, communications material pertaining to um, our ride-on-demand service and our new app. Uh, focusing again on the app, but I want to reiterate that residents are able to book uh, again through uh, the web as well as the telephone. Next slide, please. Uh, additional actions planned for 2024, um, we do plan to initiate the development of a travel training program. We also intend to replace our real-time message signs at the Oakville GO Station, Sheridan College, and the Bronte GO Station with new digital signage. We are also trying to protect for the ability to do um, uh, I'm sorry, the, the word is, has escaped me, pardon me, but text features um, with those digital signs. Uh, and in, in addition, we will be completing our five-year business plan uh, to inform future services. And I'm just highlighting uh, the five-year business plan at a very high level. Um, if I just mention that we do have our consultant uh, here this evening who will present um, on the five-year business plan, so I'm just, again, mentioning it at a high level. Jonathan will get into the five-year in more detail for you. And next slide. That is the end of the presentation. As I said, I'm happy to take any questions or comments uh, this evening. In addition, please feel free to contact me and provide any additional feedback following the meeting as well. Are there any questions for Joanne? Yes, go ahead. Thank you, Joanne. Um, at the end there, you said one of the action plans was a travel training program. Can you expand on that, what that means? So that is developing a formal program to assist residents with learning how to use transit. And, um, and for all the demographics, all age groups, um, there would be different emphasis if we were travel training uh, a resident who uses our specialized transit service, how to use conventional if, if they're able. That would involve a different set of training um, tools than if we're going out to a school to help uh, youth learn how to use transit for the first time. It's, it's there so that the um, it's, it's basically the how to, if you, uh, to use transit. We have done it in an, um, I'm going to say, a more informal way for a number of years. We have done travel training with seniors groups in Oakville. We have done travel training with newcomer groups. In addition, we have done some as well with high school students at various high schools. So this is really establishing the formal program and making sure that the, the staffing and resources are in place to be able to do it on an ongoing basis. Thank you, that's great. Um, two additional comments. Uh, I appreciate seeing that the, there are audits being done on the audio and the visual. Uh, I've expressed this to this group before that I, I ride transit quite frequently and the uh, conventional type of transit and notice a number of times that the, the audio or the visual isn't working. So I appreciate that at least there's an audit being done and, and it can be addressed. Um, with regard to the lowering of the bus or kneeling bus, also the, um, 
I would like to see some kind of criteria or and it not based on a driver's judgment. Right. Again, personal experience witnessing daily that flows, floors are not lowered for certain people or you can tell. Right. You know, so it just, just a comment to yeah. what in my observations are. So. Yes, thank you. Thank you, John. Yes, go ahead, Deborah. Thank you, Joanne. I just had a question about the ride on demand, so I, I appreciate that you're expanding it to different neighborhoods. Uh, is there a process how you choose the neighborhoods that it's being expanded to, or is there? Yes, so in, in part, one of the things that we're doing is we're taking a look um, at our conventional fixed route system. We are rationalizing um, yeah, the demand for the route. That's the demand in total as well as the demand at certain times of day or even for specific trips. And for those routes where the demand may not be as great, either for the entire route on whole, in whole or for certain times of day, then we consider that a route for a potential candidate to convert to on-demand services. So that is one part of the focus. And I think that it's fair to say Jonathan will be will also potentially cover a bit of this uh, when he talks about the five-year plan and how we also develop the route network going forward. Because the route network going forward will be what we we're deeming a, a full family of service model where we will be providing more on-demand service in, in those more localized neighborhoods that will feed into um, the, the base grid network of fixed route service. Um, so as I said, one, one part of it is looking for that conversion. Uh, and then as I, said, I mentioned before, North Oakville has had ride on demand for quite a while. We will continue to use on demand service in newer neighborhoods that are developing because we are able to physically get a smaller vehicle into those communities well ahead of when we can get a larger 40-foot conventional bus on an established, uh, you know, the established road network. So it is a great way to introduce service to a brand new community and then over time um, transition that to a fixed route uh, where it's applicable. Thank you. Any further questions or comments for Joanne? If not, I have one comment. You've heard me say this repeatedly before, Joanne, I'm sure. You're talking about, you're talking about interaction with the other local communities for uh, the handy van service, which is terrific. The one part that gets missed in all of this, we as a town do not have any strength or uh, association with Metrolinx. And I think that's very important that the town have some interaction with Metrolinx so that we all can work together to utilize the, uh, the transportation system that's available for everybody in the whole community, not just this community. If I could just uh, respond in part to that, um, we are, the province has, has uh, spent, um, pre the province has spent a, a good amount of time with all of us in working towards fare and service integration. Up until now, a large portion of that focus has been on fare integration. The recent uh, Go One Fare um, is, is sort of a result of that work. Right now, collectively, we are working on the service integration portion of fare and service integration. And one of the priorities also is, is looking at potential ways to make travel for specialized transit easier across the entire big R region. Um, so some of that work is underway and we're certainly uh, across the GTHA and beyond, it's really the GGH, um, that we're having those conversations together. So that is taking place, maybe, maybe a little bit slower than we all want, um, but there is that conversation at the table. Thank you. Any further comments or questions? Hearing and seeing none, I would entertain a motion to accept the receipt of the Oakville Transit Accessibility Plan for 2024. So moved. All in favor, raise your hand, please. Motion carries. Thank, Thank you, you, John. Thank you. 
Moving on to the next item is 4.4, Oakville Transit five-year business plan. Good afternoon, committee members. Um, I think I have a couple slides, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Mr. Chair, may I recommend um, we have Andrea Wood on the on the line. Perhaps we could move to 4.5. Sure, no problem. And I know there's no presentation uh, for this item. Andrea, we're looking forward to your report. Good evening, Chair and Committee. I am just here to say hello tonight and to give you an update on the Oakville Universal Design Standards. Update for 2024, which will be version three. This is uh, to let you know that we have received all your timely comments from the subcommittee. Thank you very much. And um, all the comments will be incorporated into the new document with one item for discussion that um, we're unable to do. It's noted on the Report for backrests at toilets. So they are straight and um, we feel in the consultant feels that's human space, a division of BB, BDP Quadrangle, um, an international firm says that the straight backrests suit the most users. So if the committee is in agreement for that, um, facility services would like to keep it as a straight backrest at the toilets. And our new sections have been added. It is very exciting. I'd like to present the, uh, the new version to you by September. The new sections are strategies for neurodiversity, functional and cognitive barriers, acoustics and lighting, as well as the addition of a maintenance section for maintenance and priority of accessible elements has been added and it is a town priority. Um, and it's also under the AODA, the Act as um, Integrated Standards for Accessibility Regulations item. So it, hopefully it's all in there. And the next time you see me, I will present the final copy. If there are any questions, I will take those. I'm the first questioner because I'm the one that made comment about the backrests. Yes, I'm sorry. I just used one of these washrooms right here in City Hall on the second floor. It has one of those backrests. And I can tell you, when I get on the toilet, it is painful. So backrests are actually an Ontario Building Code item under um, 3.84 accessibility. And other than a toilet seat cover, which are, I, as um, I understand from the Rick Hansen Foundation, they are the best suited, but because we now have touchless flush operators, we can't do toilet seat covers. So there are a skinny backrest. Um, I don't know, uh, Chair, if you have any other suggestions, I would be grateful to look into those. The only other suggestion I have is put a padding on it. Padding. Very good. I will look into that. Thank you. Noted. Any further comments? By the way, I'd like to make, make my comment that I really thank the, the committee for the comments they sent forward to you. 
And I also appreciate very much that you've understood what we asked for and you're going to include it all. So are there any more comments? Hearing none, I'd ask for uh, receipt, uh, 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 approval of the receipt of the Oakville Universal Design Standards update. May I have that motion for receipt? So moved. Thank you, Karen. All Thank you very favor. much, Chair. All in favor, raise your hand. Motion passes. Thank you very much. I appreciate your information, Karen, and your feedback. Okay. Can we have a, verb, uh, a verbal on 4.4? 4. That's great. Thanks. All right. There we go. Um, all right, good afternoon, uh, committee members. Um, my name is Jonathan Chai, Transportation Planning Lead at a consulting engineering firm called HDR. And I'm pleased to present to you today a summary of the work that we're doing for Oakville Transit uh, and their five-year business plan. And we'd be pleased to consider any suggestions that the committee may have uh, in our study. Uh, this next slide. So Oakville Transit's undertaking a five-year business plan to consider uh, changes and improvements to transit services to support community growth, uh, to respond to changing needs, to respond to customer feedback, and to align with provincial, regional, and local uh, initiatives over the five-year period uh, and beyond as well. The key goal here is attracting more riders to Oakville Transit by providing more convenient and accessible services, and ultimately ridership growth will be the key measure of success. So the study was initiated in the fall of 2023, and we recently held our second round of public consultations in the spring of 2024. We're currently drafting the five-year plan recommendations and the draft final report, and we're aiming to complete the study uh, by the first quarter of 2025. So there's, there are three key drivers for, for a new business plan for Oakville Transit. Firstly, community growth. The town is doing its part in responding to the, the housing crisis that we're all in. And the transit system needs to be adjusted to better support this growth over the five-year period. But at the same time, the town is planning for even more growth over the next 20 to 30 years in alignment with the town's official plan and the ongoing uh, Oakville Transportation Master Plan study. Secondly, customer feedback. Uh, we've heard from transit customers that they want more. And, and better services such as improved frequency, on-time performance and reliability, customer service, better maintenance and accessibility at bus stops, and more direct routes to key destinations. And finally, alignment with the updated planning context. Uh, so work is ongoing at all governmental levels to improve mobility across the region. Uh, Metrolinx is continuing to advance their regional express rail initiative, fare and service integration across municipal boundaries, rapid transit improvements, uh, such as along Dundas, the Dundas Corridor, Halton Region initiatives, including, including the ongoing integrated uh, mobility master plan, and the town of Oakville's own plans, including the Palermo Transit Terminal, ongoing TMP as mentioned, active transportation plans, and fleet electrification. Next slide. So strategic components of the five-year plan include, firstly, establishing a strong policy foundation, uh, focusing on more direct routes, as mentioned, less duplication, and uh, supporting key destinations, and using that to guide service improvements um, and, and the bus stop guidelines. Secondly, developing the, the five-year plan with an eye towards how it will guide the longer-term future frequent transit network uh, to support the longer-term growth. Thirdly, a service plan that gets into the details about hours of operations, uh, schedule frequency, and fleet requirements um, uh, to support the capital planning of the town as well. And then finally, a, a financial plan which identifies an operating and capital budget over the next five-year period. Uh, so we also followed the stepwise approach to crafting the updated service plan. Uh, starting with uh, developing a strong understanding of the base road network, where people want to travel to and from, and also considering feedback from the community as well as industry best practices, all resulting in an updated plan uh, to create a more grid-based uh, route network supported by on-demand services. 
Next slide. So engaging with the community was a, a really critical component to this study. And we had two rounds of public consultation with the last round in March and April of this year. Next slide. So the study has incorporated feedback from the community uh, through an extensive engagement program, as mentioned. Uh, we held in-person drop-in events at 11 locations across the town that are listed on the slide there. In total, we engaged over 1,000 people uh, with written comments from over 100 people as well. We also engaged the community through an online survey with over 240 responses. And finally, we reviewed customer service feedback um, with over 1,000 comments as well. A few key points about what we heard from the community are highlighted on this slide. Uh, some key points included uh, increased service frequency and reliability. I know I've mentioned these many times, but these are key things that are driving our plan. Uh, better bus stops and shelter conditions, more seamless connections with GO trains. And there was also a strong emphasis on continuing to enhance accessibility for riders with disabilities. At one of our meetings, this included, there was a representative from the CNIB uh, who is advocating for accessibility-focused infrastructure improvements uh, for blind and low vision uh, travelers. And lastly, we also received several uh, specific route suggestions as well. Next slide. So in terms of the recommended network plan, we did uh, start from the existing network as a base, of course. If we move to the next slide. Um, and then building upon the, the approach and principles that were identified on previous slides, we identified a recommended future proposed uh, service map for the next five years. Uh, as Joanne mentioned, we kind of followed a, a family of service model and kept that in mind, uh, which would include different types of service to better respond to the needs of different types of travelers uh, throughout the town. Uh, some key changes to highlight include uh, moving towards a more frequent grid-based network of services, uh, including a new continuous north-south route, the number two on the map in the middle there, uh, along Dorval and Neyakawa. Uh, and some new connections are also identified to the new uh, Palermo terminal uh, at the Dundas and Bronte uh, inter intersection. And as Joanne highlighted earlier, the GERD network uh, would be supported by on-demand zones, um, highlighted in the light brown and orange, or orange uh, shading on the map there. Next slide. Uh, just some key benefits of the plan are highlighted here. Um, you know, really providing a more direct, convenient route network uh, with enhanced connections to major destinations throughout the town, uh, such as the hospital areas and the downtowns. Um, new service standards with increased hours of operation and better on-time performance. Uh, enhanced bus stop standards uh, that would include larger waiting pads uh, that would be more accessible and improved pedestrian connections. Additional on-demand and, and base transit routes uh, that better serve uh, the community. And identifying a frequent transit network uh, that would be more convenient uh, for people to access along higher transit or transit, higher order transit corridors, uh, as well as improved connections to, to key services such as the GO train and key locations as, such as the, the downtown Bronte Village areas, and as well as the adjacent communities. So relevant to this community um, or this committee, uh, the town has several policies um, relevant to Oakville Transit. Uh, firstly, the town is committed to eliminating barriers and providing accessible services. Uh, Oakville Transit also provides specialized services and meet, that meets or exceeds AODA Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act standards for infrastructure. And furthermore, as part of this study, uh, bus stop design guidelines uh, are being updated to consider industry best practices uh, in bus stop design. Uh, so based on the best practices review, uh, the recommended bus stop layout uh, ensures a minimum area of 2.35 meters uh, laterally uh, by 1.8 meters wide uh, for a front door boarding and a lighting pad. You can see in the diagram there, we show the 1.8 meter uh, width between the shelter and the roadway and a much longer like nine meter uh, pad, uh, which is you know, almost the length of, of a bus. Uh, the, the clearance area also can consist of a combination of a concrete uh, landing pad and adjacent sidewalk. And, and this design would facilitate access for customers 
uh, using wheelchairs and mobility assisted devices. Next slide. Additionally, uh, Oakville Transit considers a bus stop being accessible when it connects to a sidewalk or pedestrian path of travel because all transit co customers begin and end their journey uh, as pedestrians, wheelers, or cyclists. Uh, we do recommend that active transportation access to and from bus stops uh, is considered strongly in bus stop planning, guided by 5A principles, and that 5A stands for always available for all ages and abilities, uh, planning for the active transportation network, as well as universal design standards. In addition, this transit business plan uh, will align with the ongoing transportation master plan study, uh, which is reviewing the active transportation network and identifying relevant policies uh, to support bus stop access, uh, as well as the recommendations of this transit business plan. So I think that's my last slide. So happy to take any questions. Are there any questions for Jonathan or comments? Yes, go ahead, uh, Devin. Uh, hi, I just, I, I noted that you mentioned the uh, improved integration with the Go train service. And I just wondered if you had a couple of comments on, on what on, on what that is, what might that look like? What would you want? Right, so I think part of the challenge sometimes is, is where you have a certain frequency of, of service uh, for Oakville Transit. And sometimes that, uh, when the when the train arrives, it doesn't align with when the buses for Oakville Transit are, arrive. So it's an ongoing um, col collaboration that needs to happen between uh, the, the Go Rail service as well as Oakville Transit services, uh, because sometimes uh, you know the, the Go system updates their schedule, and then Oakville Transit would then need to adjust their schedule uh, in order to make sure that things are uh, align. And, and you know, I've experienced this myself. Uh, sometimes I've arrived at a GO station only to see the bus leaving and then have to wait another half an hour um, to wait to catch the next bus. So that's kind of the challenge. Jonathan, uh, yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm so sorry. I had a follow-up question. Is that okay? <laughs> Go ahead. Um, so I, I, I just wanted to add to that, um, and apologies again, uh, that uh, another layer of integration might also look like uh, really interrogating the time it takes to get from our core GO stations, Bronte and Oakville, to those middle sections where they're between. So thinking about third line and up north, fourth line and up north, one of the, the accessibility challenges I faced is the time it takes to get from that GO station to those 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 locations between. Um, between. So I, I would just include that in the category of integrating with the GO system. Thanks. If I may, that I guess that could include like transit priority improvements um, that that could help with the run times of the buses and, and things of that nature. And that is certainly, uh, you know, some measures that would that could be considered uh, in in the planning. I'd also like to make one one comment on the on integration. I often go to meetings in downtown Toronto, come back on the go uh, on on the on the go train, and get off at ten o'clock and I can't get a bus. So it would be very helpful if the buses ran, you know, sort of to midnight, as opposed to when they stop now. Thank you, no, comment noted, and I know it's, uh, it's, it's, it's important to, for people to, to, that certainly rely on transit to have a bus accessible to them, um, but that's, yes, yeah, certainly a comment that w we will note. Any further questions or comments for Jonathan? David, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you to our consultant, uh, you talked about grid versus uh, spoke or hub. Uh, just could you provide a little more detail on that for those that may not be aware of our current system feeding to the go, uh, feeding to the go trains and how a grid system uh, could provide better service? Thank you, Councillor, for the question. Um, yeah, so like a, a, a spoken hub model uh, basically centers around, um, you know, very specific key destinations. I, I think the current uh, routing of Oakville Transit does tend to focus more on connecting to the GO stations, kind of thinking about more of like a commuter-focused planning pattern. Um, a, a more grid-based network would focus uh, service along the main arteries, 
uh, that would be much more, provide much more broad-based connectivity to different destinations throughout the town. Uh, you know, for example, um, you know, the uptown core at Trafalgar and Dundas, it may not be as well served as, as the GO station, for example, or, or other locations like the hospital at Third Line in Dundas. Um, that could be better served if you had more frequent service along Dundas. Um, and that also aligns with the higher order transit planning that uh, Metrolinx is, in, is doing along, along Dundas as well. So it's kind of creating that, that's, that situation where um, you know, frequent service is provided not just to get to the GO station during peak hours, but um, it better connects destinations at all times of day, essentially. So I hope that helps kind of give some context to, to what the, a more grid-based network means versus a hub-and-spoke type model. Thank you very much for that. And Mr. Chair, I have another question. Is Ms. Phoenix still there? I can't see the, the gallery there. Yes, she is. All right. Uh, I have a question for Joanne then in terms of under the business plan, uh, we've talked in the past about the uh, implementation of free fares for youth and for seniors. Uh, our first meeting of the budget committee is coming up uh, next week, I believe, to kick off the 2025 uh, budget process. Where do we stand with free fares uh, for those with disabilities? Well, right now, um, those fares apply to, to everybody, um, regardless of what type of service they're using. So whether you're a senior, uh, a youth, or a child, you ride free on all transit services. So for those residents with disabilities who might already be using our caravan service, those rides are free as well if they're within those age demographics. Um, if you're referring to making the adult fare specific to caravan. Um, I, I, right now, I don't have any additional information on that portion of it. All right, so that's something for the budget committee to, uh, to consider. Great, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're welcome. Any further comments or questions for Jonathan? Hearing and seeing done. I would entertain a motion to accept accept receipt of this report. So moved. Thank you very much. All in favor, raise your hand. Motion carries. <clears throat> Before going on to the information items, I've got a statement to make. The above recommendations that have been approved by the committee will be, be presented to council through the receipt of the meeting minutes. In accordance with the committee's terms of reference, any advice or recommendation that requires action or implementation by town staff must be approved by town council. And unless separated from the minutes by a motion from a council member, the recommendations are acknowledged as advice to council but not deemed as formal directives to staff. And at that point, I'll ask uh, Councillor Giddings, is there anything you wish to withdraw to make a motion from this uh, committee? <laughs> no, I think, I think we are good. Great, thank you very much. Okay, moving on to the information items. Item 5.1, the County of of Prince Edward resolution, a call to action to meet the deadline of an accessibility Ontario by 2025. Yes, Joanne. Yep, I can just speak to that briefly. So we just wanted to highlight that this was emailed to the committee uh, back in April, uh, April 3rd of this year. And it's a resolution uh, from Prince Edward County um, about uh, the, the council's call to action. So we wanted to share that with the committee. Thank you. And if you'd like, I, once, once ready, I can speak briefly to item 5.2 and 5.3 as well. Okay, go ahead. Okay, great. Um, so we just included this in the agenda as well. Item uh, 5.2, share your feedback on our plain language standard. Uh, so this also was sent uh, to the committee for information. 
and uh, this is with the government of Canada. And we just, I just wanted to highlight that the public review ends on Monday, July, uh, July 8th at midnight. So if you, uh, if you yourselves or any member of the public wishes to provide feedback, please, please do that. And then moving to 5.3, so nothing was included in the agenda. I just wanted to provide a verbal update to the to the committee uh, that the staff consultation um, on the survey results, which we shared with the committee back in March, that has concluded. So we are working on the draft multi-year accessibility plan. Uh, what we are doing is we are planning to uh, do what is called a web release only. So in the past, you may have seen um, a PDF version of the document. So what we've been discussing is, uh, is having it available on the website. Uh, but of course, when you go on the website, you have the ability to, to print the entire package. So you will still see it all. Um, but it's just a way to make it even more accessible rather than move it into a, a PDF format. Um, if you're interested, I can send an example. It's uh, the, the 2022 annual report uh, was published in this manner as well. So if you'd like, I can share, you th share the link with the, the committee to kind of see how it's laid out on the website. It's quite user friendly. Um, and as mentioned earlier, we will be coming back in September with a draft multi-year accessibility plan uh, for, uh, for feedback from the committee. Andrea, I'd appreciate you sending us that link. Absolutely, thank you. And that concludes the information items. Comes down to the date and time of our next meeting. Uh, Mr. Yes. Chair, uh, there is a question from Councillor yes. Giddings. Councillor Giddings, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Under uh, the information items, Andrea, do you have the motion that uh, Council sent through uh, to the province under the strategic plan and, and priorities? If not, I have a copy here. I just... Uh, I, I think it could be included under the multi-year accessibility plan as it as it speaks to that for all municipalities. Yeah, that would be excellent. And if if you have it in front of you, if you'd like to read it, that would be that would be uh, wonderful. Thank you. the uh, The province had asked municipalities to report back in terms of uh, strategic priorities, and so I'd like to thank Andrea for. Uh, stick handling and wordsmithing the following in terms of the implementation, implementation of the AODA. Uh, the town of Oakville requested that the province develop a comprehensive action plan aimed at implementing recommendations to achieve the goal of the AODA, making Ontario fully accessible by 2025. If the established timelines timelines are unattainable, it is requested that the province review and adjust their timelines accordingly, establish specific steps and concrete measures, and report on the progress towards the goal of a fully accessible Ontario. Uh, the reason for this being included uh, to the province was because I've, I've heard frustration from members of this committee for several years as to whether the 2025 timeline was accurate and whether it would be achieved. So we thought that it was, uh, council thought it was important to send this through as one of our requests. Councillor Giddings, have you had any feedback on that? Uh, that, great question, Mr. Chair. That went through uh, council, I believe, May 27th. So uh, it may be a may be a ways yet. Thank you. And, and through, through you, Mr. Chair, I'd be happy to send a link to that as well uh, when I send the other link to the committee. Thank you. Uh, I, I, the only comment I would make on that, the, I think there have been three updates on how things are happening with AOD 2025. And every one of them says they're not going to make it. And also, in my observation, they're not either. <laughs> Go ahead. Deborah, yes, please. Yes, thank you. I just wanted to take this opportunity to uh, express my appreciation and thank uh, Andrea and the staff that did arrange for the tour of the um, Oakville Trafalgar Community Centre. Um, it was very informative um, and uh, very inspiring as well. So thank you very much. I do appreciate that, that you did that on behalf of the committee. Thank you. I 
know, I echo that, Deborah. Thank you to the committee for highlighting such a wonderful community center and it's a standard for the next one to be built, right? I appreciate that information. Unfortunately, I was not able to attend. Anyway, this comes down to the date and time of the next meeting, unless there are other uh, things. Mr. Chair, I need to remind you to do move motion for uh, two items that information items were oh, yeah. received. Uh, thank, thank you, you very much, Jasmina. I would like to have a motion for acceptance of the information items. So moved. Thank you. All in favor, raise your hand. Motion passes. Now, I think I'm correct in getting to the date and time of our next meeting. At September 12th, 2024, in the Oakville Municipal Building in the Council Chambers at 4 p.m. And I'd like to thank very much for you know, to the Council allowing us to come into their, their uh, august chambers because it certainly makes this e meeting a lot easier to, to run. And I think it's been very successful in terms of having our comments and the people who have, who have presented for us today. So I thank you all very much. And with that, I entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Thank you, Deborah. And I, the vote is uh, by everybody leaving. <laughs> so thank you, everybody. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair.